Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Exerbia. Not sure if that's right. Specifically this video here called So You Want to Build a Nuke. This is probably the most common question I get asked on this channel is how to build a nuke. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fultz. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's get right into it. So, you want to build a nuke, eh? Oh well, for that, you'll need some uranium. Uranium is a radioactive element. It has many uses, including curing cancer, generating power. I guess you could use uranium. Mainly think of things like cobalt-60 uh, for things that have the potential to uh, cure cancer. But I guess you could. It's an alpha source, so very short-range treatment in brachytherapy where you put a radioisotope very close to the tumor as opposed to using a x-ray or gamma source. But then the first thing I think of, I guess technically you could also use depleted uranium as shielding, kind of like using bricks of lead just because it has a high atomic number. Making people immediately stop fucking existing. <laughs> anyway, once you've mined some uranium, you'll need to enrich it. The main thing you use uranium for is in, in a nuclear power plant. At least that's what I'm used to. Why? Because isotopes. If you vary the neutrons in an element, you get different- That looks so cool. I want a periodic table tile set like that. Periodic Scrabble, what it looks like. Cosplay versions of that element. And the version we want here is Uranium-235 because it's good in bombs and shit. So it's off to the centrifuges. <laughs> yep. So Uranium-235, the reason why you want that is because it is the fissile element, meaning it will fission readily with thermal neutrons. So yes, natural uranium, it's less than 1%. In a nuclear power plant, it's on the order of 3 to 5%. On, but in a nuclear bomb, you're going to want it in upwards of 90%. So yes, you are going to need quite a lot of centrifuges or diffusion chambers, depending on which method of enrichment you're using. Yes, if you're going to make a bomb, you're going to need a lot of uranium-235 or plutonium-239 if you want to make it that way. For some whizzy fun time, and soon you'll have shiny apocalypse cookies before you- Hey, it's the same stock photo I use sometimes. <laughs> Awesome. A nuclear holocaust. And if you're still serious about building this thing, we'll need to talk about fission and fusion. Thanks to this smoking hot piece of physicist booty, we now know you can make a little bit of mass <laughs> oh into a lot of energy. And one way of doing that is via fission. Fission is when you give big atomic nuclei a bonk and convert them into smaller nuclei, and you get loads of energy from that. It's how nuclear reactors work, and also bombs. I like that a lot of the times they always show someone panning over a cooling tower. Um, just to specify, I'm sure the original creator knew this, but that's not where the fission reactions occur. That is just a cooling tower for the main condenser in the secondary non-nuclear part of the plant. But yeah, that's not a bad explanation of fission. I, I love it. Fission is the reverse of that, basically, where nuclei combine. It's how the sun works, and also bombs in a fission. So one thing I to clarify about fusion is trying to do a fission reaction in reverse. No, not really. I mean, it's technically not impossible, but it would take so much more energy than you would actually get. And it's going to be much smaller things. So those dense looking... Uh, Nuclei, no. It's going to be smaller things like hydrogen and helium and lithium. Um, the goal is to get the uranium to release neutrons. One can do this via explosives or claiming to have engaged in sexual intercourse with the uranium's mother. Oh These neutrons will hit the unstable nuclei of the rest of the uranium, and at that point, well, whatever argument it was. I've never heard a uh, comparison of uh, fission to sex, but I guess, yeah, the, the neutron would be the male element and the uh, target target nuclei being the uranium would be the female element. Then they split and create more. There's even a term for fission products called the daughter nuclei, and then it also creates more neutrons, and then there's more generation, so not a bad comparison. That led you to detonate this thing, let's just say you won that one. But if you're really pissed off, then you'll need a fusion bomb. This is a double whammy. The first stage is fission, then switches to fusion, creating essentially a star on Earth. Anyway, that's- It creates conditions. In fact, the heat 
is actually greater than that of the core of the sun. Because the sun's got all that gravity that can help it cause all that pressure and sustain it for a long period of time. But if you're talking like raw power, strictly power in terms of energy per unit time, you, would act you could get some very, very big numbers and very big temperatures greater than that of the sun. However, it happens on the order of nanoseconds. So this star-like existence isn't there for long. In fact, by the time you see the explosion, the star is ancient history. Nuke built, so it's off to the races, baby. Well, we'll need somewhere quiet to test it out. How's about somewhere near the Jornado del Muerto Desert in New Mexico? Lovely little spot for a picnic. Okay. Make sure to bring some jam, those little triangular sandwiches, and a crippling certainty that thanks to you, humankind will forevermore be held hostage by itself. Mm. The first ever nuclear device is detonated on July 16th, 1945, codename Trinity. The device explodes with the equivalent power of 22,000 tons of TNT. Later, Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, will say, I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Just under a month later, the B-29 Enola Gay will drop the fission bomb Little Boy over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. It will explode with the power of 15,000 tons of TNT. Above will preside a mushroom cloud 60,000 feet high. Below, 70,000 people are immediately incinerated and mutilated by a shockwave traveling faster than the speed of sound. One of the reasons why the uh, Little Boy bomb was a lesser yield than the Trinity was it was a completely different design. The design, they were so confident it would work that they didn't need to test it. The Trinity design was similar to the second bomb, the, the Fat Man that was dropped on Nagasaki. and. This one used a lot of the uranium-235, in fact, probably close to all of it that existed in the world at the time, because this was, there was no arms race, there was no other reason to have large amounts of uranium-235, and not much of it existed naturally, so that's one of the reasons, whereas the other weapons mainly used plutonium in the case of Trinity and Fat Man. Thousands of people who are not killed in the initial blasts will be exposed to ionizing radiation, suffering the effects for decades to come. Hemorrhaging, cancer, and genetic mutations. Three days later, a second bomb called- And the effects of the, the radiation effects would have been far worse if it was a surface-based detonation. That's one of the reasons why, although horrible, the effects the horrific effects of the radiation poisonings and contamination were not nearly as bad as they could have been. But at the same time, because it was airburst, it actually maximized the overall destruction because the explode, explosion, the fireball, the shock wave, the thermal pulse was a lot more deadly. It's actually kind of a trade-off. The height at which the bomb is detonated changes the dynamics of how the bomb actually works. So for attacking a large, urban, populated area to maximize destruction would be a higher detonation like what was used. But if you're going to attack a heavily fortified, say, a missile silo, then you're going to want to go with a surface detonation. Man will be dropped on the seaport of Nagasaki. At least 60,000 people will be killed. Japan will surrender three weeks later, and the governments of the world will almost unanimously agree that this must never happen again. Not intentionally, not by accident, not by ignorance. In 1947, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists devised a doomsday clock with midnight representing absolute global catastrophe. Oh, I've heard of Today, this. the clock stands at 100 seconds to midnight. Pretty bad, but frankly, it's hard to see what they're getting their little lab coats in a twist about, eh? World War II was ages ago. The threat of nuclear war is long gone. Other than, well, okay. In 1961, several four megaton nukes might have slightly fallen out of a B-52 over North Carolina. Uh, yeah, these broken arrow type nuclear weapons mishaps are just crazy to think about. I'll pin a comment down below where I look at a video that goes over many of these incidents. You want to check that out. Which narrowly avoided detonating because of a single safety switch. But okay, other than that. Well, in 1962, there's there's, a Soviet patrol submarine- There's a lot of these. A shockingly crazy amount of these. 
might have slightly lost contact with the land, the captain, assuming World War III had already started, and was about to fire a 10 kiloton nuke torpedo at a nearby US fleet before the flotilla commander could calm him down, and maybe 1967, when a solar flare mm -hmm. took out a few NORAD radars, the US might have slightly freaked out and almost launched a bomber counter-strike against the Soviet Union. Then 1969, North Korea shot down a US radar surveillance plane. President Richard Nixon, allegedly drunk, gave the order for a nuclear strike in retaliation. Luckily, Henry Kissinger stepped in, wow. and we're still here. I didn't hear about that one. Hmm. Just the entire Cold War, basically 40 years of unrelenting nuclear panic, and then you remember the precarious state of mutually assured destruction. Which is, well, when a mummy country and a daddy country hate each other very oh, much, no. sometimes they get embroiled in a nuclear standoff. And one little deterrent against pushing the button is the knowledge that in the time it takes for your missiles to reach your enemy, your enemy will have kindly fired theirs back at you. The idea is that if you're rational, neither of you are going to strike first. Until you remember that humans are not rational, we are, I believe the anthropological term is, fucking morons. <laughs> Currently- <laughs> I'm sure that's the technical term, but yeah, does how safe does that make you guys feel? I get a lot of comments saying that I've mentioned this in several other videos that no, it's not going to be an, a new a full nuclear exchange still won't be enough to completely wipe out the population or anything like that. But yes, it will change the face of the world as we know it. As I've said before, we do not want to stress test this. Now, one thing I will say is it is positive that the overall number of nuclear weapons is going down, so that. The damage of the hypothetical mutual assured destruction has gone down since the 1980s, the 1960s, the height of the Cold War, but it would still be horrible. The worst war that the world has ever seen if something like this were to happen. Nine countries have nukes, that's the US, Russia, France, my homeland of crumpets and self-hate, Pakistan, India, Israel, the Upper Tea Korea, and of course, China. And that's not to mention, several countries probably have hypersonic nuclear missiles now, which can fly upwards of five times the speed of sound. The thing on the hypersonic missiles, um... Regular ICBMs are hypersonic. They just travel in a parabolic trajectory rather than a line drive trajectory. It's more of their, the whole challenge to intercept thing, even though... So I'm not, I'm not a military strategy expert, but how much does it really change anything? You're just changing the trajectory of the missiles, and even the regular missiles are pretty hard to intercept rendering modern missile defense systems about as effective as putting up a little sign that says, Oh, don't nuke us, mate. You said you wouldn't. <laughs> what are you doing? You said you wouldn't. Why are you... Oh, for fuck's sake, you're such a dick. Or rather, if these puppies launch, in the words of the motto of the US Postal Service, Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night shall stay these couriers from swift completion of their appointed rounds. Oh, that actually makes me feel better. If they're only as reliable as the US Postal Service, we, we have nothing to worry about. It's a hundred seconds to midnight, baby. Nuclear Armageddon ain't gone anywhere. The Cold War ended in 91, but the real war, the silent war, has only just started because we discovered a 23rd century technology in the 20th century, and we're too primitive for this shit. Wait, what? Oh, they're saying it's so hyper-advanced. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. I've actually never heard it referred to as that, but I guess it's made that quantum leap in technology. Let's see what I did there. Right now. And ironically, nukes are so prevalent in entertainment and media that we've almost forgotten this is real. That if we aren't constantly vigilant, apocalypse could happen any time and it would be the end of everything, including possibly the only instance of life anywhere in the universe. All just because of some mental general or dickhead dictator. As Einstein allegedly said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought. I've heard this one, World yeah. War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. I know he was getting it into the end, I don't know if it means... And I know we're not talking about the literal end of creation should something like this happen, but let's just stick to the peaceful use of nuclear technology with nuclear power plants. That seems like the best way to go. But before you go, I just wanted to express how grateful I am for all of you. At the time of recording this, it's my channel's one year anniversary, and this has been incredible. I never thought I would have over 50,000 subscribers and over seven and a half million views within my first year. 
<laughs> my initial goal I had in my head was a thousand subscribers, and at the time I thought that was a bit of a stretch goal, but wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been amazing, and I look forward to continuing to educate and share what I know about nuclear power and nuclear technologies. This has been truly amazing. I can't imagine where I'll where I'll be next year, but this is, if it's anything like this, this has been tr a truly incredible experience, and I really can't thank you guys enough. Until next time.